Welcome to this lecture on art and politics in early Florence. So I want to walk us through some of the pieces in the Academia, which is one of the most important museums in Florence. Before we get started, I want to give a little overview and say that one of the things to come out of this period is the idea of an artist, uh, particularly a specific artist who's famous enough that uh, the rich and the powerful fought over them. Uh, so that's why we'll see with Michelangelo and also um, we're going to look at da Vinci's pieces in, a, in another in another lecture, and they were constantly being pulled to various patrons. Sometimes um, the patrons demanded that they come. Like if you, if the Pope wanted you to come work for him, you did. So um, it was both a blessing and a curse to be at this forefront of fame. We can see the David down at the end of this hallway, and I like this photo because it shows a little bit of the scale see how he's much bigger than life size. He's also meant to be viewed from below. Both the size and the viewpoint are because this piece was originally commissioned to be up in an alcove in the Duomo, high up above the streets where people would be uh, looking up from, from far below. When the statue was finished, the the commissioners were were so impressed. They said, oh, no, 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 this needs to be down here where everybody can see it. So the statue was originally placed in front of the Duomo in the courtyard. Uh, it was damaged in a riot. So it was moved inside and eventually ended up here in the academia. If you visit Florence, you can see outside the Duomo a replica of the statue, which is in its original place uh, on the courtyard outside of the Oh, sorry, the Duomo. So this early piece is um, going to rocket Michelangelo to, to stardom. And it uh, briefly, I want to talk, we'll come back to this Hall of Prisoners slide, but briefly I want to talk about the statue. Um, first to talk a little bit more about the perspective that we have because of its placement. So you can see how giant his hand looks, the right hand, which is um, relaxed along his leg. And both the, kind of that angle of it and the hugeness of it is because it was meant to be seen from below. So that's um, a common misconception people have is that Michelangelo didn't know how a body works, but actually he's trying to do some foreshortening and some optical illusion to make him look the appropriate size from the ground. So David, there is a super important symbol of Florence, and there are uh, some lecture materials in this week's folder to explain that a, a bit more. He's so important because they saw themselves as an underdog in their competition with Siena to be the economic power powerhouse of the region, and like David, fought off Goliath. Florence saw themselves as the underdog fighting off the Goliath of Siena. We're really not going to talk very much about David in this lecture. I want to talk about the Hall of Prisoners. When I first visited this museum, I was so lucky, actually, that there was a huge crowd. So this was completely people when I visited all the way up to the David, so I had to wait to get closer. And it made me stop and recognize that these were statues I had studied about before I came to Florence. And I it slowed me down enough, though, that I could really be kind of mesmerized by how beautiful they are. So the unfinished prisoners are four large sculptures of male nudes. Uh, they're also known as the slaves or the captives. So they were begun, begun by Michelangelo for a huge project for the tomb of Pope Julius II de la Rivera. The first commission dates back to 1505, and it was before the assignment of the Sistine Chapel. So it, it, it was meant to be the most magnificent tomb of Christian times, composed by more than 40 figures. The four prisoners were carved for the pillars on the lower level of the tomb, and it was going to be housed in the Grand Basilica of St. Peter's in Rome. So Michelangelo spent months in the Carrara quarries to personally select the brightest marble he, he liked, and um, marking each one with three circles, which you can see some of those um, 
some of those marks on some of his pieces. So due to the mounting shortage of money, the Pope ordered him to put aside the tomb project to 1506. So this is important because this happened a lot to Michelangelo. He would be commissioned to do an important job, and then he would uh, get pulled away partway through to work on something else. So the original design was later scaled down uh, to a less grandiose proportions uh, after the Pope's death in 1513. Uh, then in 1521 and eventually in 1534, the prisoners were no longer part of the project and thus remained in Florence. So as, as popes came and went, the person who was in charge of commissioning Michelangelo's work changed, and um, this caused a lot of chaos. He, he also didn't have, I want to point out, he also didn't have um, the right to say no, because when the Pope asked you to come to Rome to, to work for him, uh, you did. But the pieces themselves are really pretty fantastic. They, uh, one way to read them is they're prisoners, that they're a, an allegory of the soul imprisoned in the flesh, slave to human, <coughs> pardon me, weaknesses. So this is the ultimate <coughs> scale we get with the finished tomb. We have Rachel on the left side. We have Moses and uh, Leah on the right. You can see more details of the tomb and Moses in our text. So the slaves themselves are actually really powerful, and um, you're welcome to to stop and and read through through the slide. But I want to point out a few things. One of them is that he worked in a way that almost you can see. <coughs> Pardon me, allergies. Almost you can see the, the figures emerging from the stone. So this is a, a practice called uh, non finito or incomplete. And that's where he's carving from the outside in and releasing the figure as opposed to like starting from the top or starting from one side and finishing it. <laughs> so <laughs> the thing I love about these is that as slaves or prisoners, you can almost see them trying to free themselves from the rock, trying to liberate themselves. And um, it's actually now claimed that he deliberately left them incomplete to recognize this eternal struggle of human beings to free themselves from their material trappings. But um, I've given other things that I've read about the time, and I, I just think he got pulled away from the project too soon and lost his patronage on this particular project. For one thing, he had to go work on the Sistine Chapel, so there was no time to finish these. But I kind of like that idea of, of reinterpreting them in a more modern light. So this is the bearded slave, often called the Atlas. Um, pardon me. One way to read these statues is that they can also be seen as symbols of the way Michelangelo felt trapped into working for the Vatican. Uh, in the Medici Chapel <laughs> the floor, there's um, there's a secret room that um, he hid in at one point, and and the Pope's men just wandered around Florence knowing that he would have to come out eventually, and he ran out of food and water and had to come up um, and was taken back to Rome. So he felt very much trapped um, by the various commissions from the church. Um, and so he didn't often get to work on the projects that that were most in his heart. Whew. So the rebellious slave or dying slave is this fantastic twisted shape on the left. Um, they're now displayed in the Louvre in Paris. So um, Vasari explains in the life, lives of the artists how they ended up in France. So in Rome, uh, Michelangelo finished entirely with his own hand, two of them. Um, and they were so impressive that, um, pardon me, that they were later sent as presents to King Francis, and that is how they ended up in France. The Pietra of Palestrina is absolutely one of my favorite pieces um, uh, of Michelangelo, even though it's unfinished. For me, this is the perspective pretty much you would have as you're looking up at the piece, and this, her right hand in the foreground holding up this um, very draped body of Christ is is just really transfixing. It's, you know, the, 
the strength of the hand is is clearly not in proportion with the rest of her body and um I think it just I love how the whole piece centers on the dynamic of this hand holding up um uh the Christ figure And I think it's interesting to see how this piece is significantly different than the David, which we saw in the first slides. It's it's part of what's called the High Renaissance style. It's a piece he worked on towards the end of his life. And um, the High Renaissance was much more symbolic. And there's a lot of tension, a lot of, you can you can really see the, the, the disappointment and the sadness in this piece, which is probably reflective of a lot of what Michelangelo was feeling about the church at that time, as it was becoming increasingly caught up in scandal about its use of power. Um, and um, we can see in some ways the, the conflict, which is going to lead to the, to the Protestant reformation in this piece. So feel free to check out these pieces uh, in more detail in the weekly folders. And I hope you enjoy this quick tour of the, the early Renaissance this week.